This is Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Fish. So, uh, it's September already, huh? Another month with no mod videos. And I know I told you guys to hold me accountable, but I've got this bad habit of trying to work on things in batches. So I've got like four projects that are half done. There's one that's being refinished, another one that well, it's also being refinished, but it needs a neck that's being crafted. One I have a neck for, but the body is in CAD and needs to be CNC'd out. Two that are about to get refrets, and one that's over there off camera that is in the middle of a pickup swap. And I've got a migraine. So basically, this entire channel is a giant mess right now. This video is going to be a struggle. So in the meantime, you guys had questions over on Discord. Don't forget to join if you haven't already. It's a fun time. Link in the description. Smack the crap out of that like button if you go on to enjoy the video that actually really helps out and let's jump into your questions and talk about what's going on in the world of guitar this week francesco babaro says and now mark has a leaked black les paul modern loaded with a pair of dominions yeah well um not really leaked but so it's an update to the previous episode of ask fish which you should definitely check out if you haven't already where we talked about how mark morton has left jackson and is now a Gibson artist. I mean, it's just wild. He's been a Jackson guy forever. Every time you saw him or Lamb of God on a magazine cover, he had his red quilt Jackson Dominion with him. Every music video, every live video, Jackson Dominion, or at least some sort of Jackson. I think he had a Jackson V in Ruin. Either way, I remember watching a rack of Jackson video he did back in like 2009 which is prehistoric in terms of the internet. And this video on the Jackson Guitars channel, less than a year old, didn't age too well. Lamb of God has been one of my top three favorite bands forever. And so I've been following their gear situation closely for years. Will Adler is pretty much the sole reason why I've got an ESP USA Eclipse being built right now. And I mean, Mark Morton has been synonymous with Jackson for the longest time. It's wild that he's a Gibson artist now. It kind of came out of nowhere. It seems like a really sudden breakup, but there he is. Gibson posted on Facebook official confirmation and i laid out my case for what i think is a first leak of a mark morton signature model he's now posted a picture of another les paul last time it was his red quilt custom shop standard this time it's a black gibson usa les paul modern modded with his signature demarzio dominion pickups it's at this time i would like to point out in that infamous cesar g picture where he's posing with that suspiciously hatfieldy aged white 84 explorer with the Kirk Hammett prototypes in the background. The two Les Pauls on the rack, I think our Mark Morton signature prototypes are in red quilt and in black. Very interesting. Les Paul Moderns also have the modern neck heel, which I'm not a huge fan of, but it means that it only has the top binding. So it's possible that his upcoming signature will have those split block Super 400 inlays with a modern neck heel, right? Everyone got their tinfoil hat on, everything's lining up, but that would be cool. There's already a lot of signatures based on the Les Paul standard, but none based on the Les Paul modern. So a Mark Morton signature Les Paul modern, that would be a first for Gibson. Now, some people are like, why are you even talking about this? We've got no concrete details at all. It's just speculation. Yes, but it's because it's fun. And also it's because I'm 100% sure there will be Mark Morton signatures. The Jackson Dominions were a cult favorite. They were in production for over 10 years in various forms. So I'm sure they sold well. So there's no way he'd leave Jackson if there wasn't a promise of a signature model at Gibson, if not a signature collection. You know, they had USA Dominions, Pro Series, X Series, all across the line. So I'm guessing whatever ends up dropping will have both Gibson USA and Epiphone versions. And hopefully they actually put in his signature Demarzios as well. It's becoming a bad habit of Gibson's where they don't. Actually, Epiphone also just posted a picture of Mark Morton with an Epiphone Les Paul Custom. So he's already in deep with the whole family. Man, those last music videos only dropped a few weeks ago and he's still using his Jacksons and that. Poor Jackson, man, he's moved on quickly. But I wouldn't take this as a sign his signature will be based on a Les Paul Custom. Lamb of God offers a VIP package where every night each guitarist will play a cheaper guitar for one song. Last tour for Mark Morton, it was an X-Series Dominion and at the end of the night, they'll sign it and give it to the fan. That's such an epic VIP package and it seems like this time it'll be an Epiphone Les Paul Custom, right? Because they're not gonna give out a custom shop standard every night. That's all that is. Back to potential upcoming signatures though. Besides just a Les Paul, I hope they also take this opportunity to do something a little more interesting, something more Dominion-esque. 
but Gibson, a Firebird modern maybe with the bound red quilt top, ebony fingerboard, the split block inlays, locking tuners, compound fingerboard radius. How cool would that be? Gibson, I'll let you have that one for free. Just make it happen. Anyways, getting carried away with the possibilities and speculation of a Mark Morton signature collection now. Again, I'll ask you now that he's officially confirmed as a Gibson artist, what do you think of the potentially leaked Mark Morton Les Pauls? And what do you hope to see out of a Mark Morton Gibson or Epiphone signature? They have a new album coming out, new tour starting next week, which I'm really excited about. So there's a lot of buzz around the band. You gotta wonder, What's happening with Willie Adler's signature situation? He's definitely not leaving ESP, although I thought the same thing about Mark Morton and Jackson. But no, everyone calm down. He's still on the ESP site. The Adler signatures are still for sale. The LTD Warbird is in stock at Guitar Center. It's actually a really cool guitar because it's an Eclipse with a bare maple neck and it's got the Fishman Moderns. But it's wild. His signature pickups have been out for five years and you still can't buy a guitar with them if you're not willing to shell out $9,000 for the Japanese ESP original. They've got to drop a new signature Willie Adler LTD at some point, right? It's been over half a decade since the Warbird launched. In fairness, he still uses the Distressed Warbird a lot. It's in the Nevermore video and all the quarantine sessions. So I get not just releasing something for the sake of just releasing something, but maybe an LTD version of that with all the wear and his signature pickups. He's also been playing his ESP USA Eclipses a lot recently. He's using his red flame top one in the Omens video, in the Omens and Checkmate playthroughs. ESP even has a whole video showing the build process and unboxing of an outrageous looking Eclipse in quilted purple sunburst. Kirk Hammett has those LTD KHVs dropping that are based on his ESP USA models. Why not Willie Adler? Especially if they borrowed that ESP USA exclusive purple sunburst color and put that on an LTD with his signature pickups. That'd be very, very, very cool. But yeah, haven't heard any rumors or anything about a new Adler signature. It's just been a suspiciously long time since we've seen anything fresh. So yeah, even fewer details on that one. But what do you guys think of that whole situation? You know what is fresh though? today's sponsor. Let's take a quick second and thank today's sponsor, Zbiotics. So Zbiotics is a scientifically engineered pre-alcohol probiotic drink with the goal of eliminating alcohol's terrible morning after effects. Science rules. So here's how it works. When you're responsibly enjoying one or more deserved drinks at the end of a tough week, a byproduct of that alcohol is a toxin called acetaldehyde. So what they've done is use the power of science to create a probiotic that you take before you drink and it works throughout the night by producing an enzyme that breaks acetaldehyde down. It gives your liver some backup. Combine this with proper sleep and hydration, you wake up ready to make the most of the next day. And I can personally attest to it. I don't drink too often because I'm really susceptible to the negative effects of alcohol. Sometimes even a single beer can be brutal after like an hour. But using Zbiotics, it's crazy. I wake up after having a responsibly fun night. I feel great, I'm productive. And it's not just me, check this out. Jake Sachs, he's a subscriber, he's getting married. She's awesome. His fiance is also sensitive to alcohol's negative effects, but for a bachelor party, she took Zbiotics and quote, she was able to enjoy drinking again without feeling like shit the next day. Now, I'm by no means encouraging binge drinking. I'm just saying, if you're like me or Jake's fiance, Zbiotics helps. So if you want to see why so many people trust Zbiotics on fun nights without giving up the next day, use my link zbiotics.com slash agafish and get 15% off by using the code agafish. There's also a 100% money back guarantee, so trying it out is kind of a no-brainer which is an apt way of describing how I feel the next day without Zbiotics. Link will also be in the description. Of course, clicking it helps support the channel by letting them know that I sent you. Deacon asks, thoughts on the possibility of Mike Stringer of Spirit Box leaving his Aristides guitars and becoming a part of the Fender family? of artists. He's recently been seen with a few EVH 5150s and a Jackson along with Fender's artist marketing manager posting about working with him. Oh man, so firstly, finally got around to listening to Spirit Box, downloaded Eternal Blue for the flight. Holy shit, they sound pissed. It's awesome. And Yellow Jacket is a fucking jam. To be honest, I didn't even know that Mike Stringer was an Aristides guy until you mentioned it. I'm a new arrival to the Spirit Box fan base. Don't gatekeep me, bro. But I've just taken a look at what you're talking about. Mike Stringer posted his rig up on Instagram and holy shit, it looks like something fucking SpaceX would be proud of. This is a modern day metal Stonehenge, a fucking monument to huge metal tone. What I'm saying is it's glorious. As for him leaving Aristides and going to Jackson, 
that would be huge. I've been saying for a while that modern Jackson guitars kind of lack identity. Like their old school shapes are obviously iconic. They have a legacy that is not going anywhere. I want to say dad metal guitars, which as a new dad, I feel like I'm entitled to poke fun at now, but there's always a subsection of people who get mad when I use that term. So I guess I won't, we move. But yeah, they're doing completely fine on their dad metal. I mean, old school metal offerings. You know the ones I mean, the pointy angled headstocks, Seymour Duncan JBs, Floyds. Their modern shapes though, they're a little soulless. Funnily enough, the last one I demoed that I thought was really boring is the one that Mike's using on tour. So what the f do I know? But no, I think that Spirit Box going to Jackson is a great thing. One, good for Spirit Box and good for Mike Stringer. They just keep going from win to win and it's increasingly rare for a metal band to explode in the way that they have. You love to see it. And two, this is what Fender and Gibson for that matter should be doing. They have their legacies, but you want to remain relevant long term in both a cultural and product sense. You have to partner up with the popular modern guitar bass bands, the current generation of guitarists that are pushing the boundaries of the craft. You know, the ones making music the older generation says requires no talent. If you're not familiar with them, Aristides aren't made of wood. They're one solid piece of an ultra durable man-made composite. They've got stainless steel frets and I believe the ones he played had Evertune. Pretty much that's the most modern metal guitar you can get. And hopefully now he's bringing some of that influence and some of those ideas of what modern metalcore and deathcore players want to Jackson. Obviously they can't use Arium, that's Aristides proprietary material, but maybe it inspires them to look into their own wood alternatives that with their resources they can bring to the production level. At the very least with what Schechter and LTD are doing, they need to bring stainless steel frets to the production level. Josh Smith of Northlane, which are an awesome metal band out of Australia, has been posting a suspicious number of times about this blue seven string Evertune baritone with a Fender headstock with his signature bare knuckle impulse on the bridge. And it could be a custom, but he kind of not so subtly leaked it in a gear chat video with Kian Hauschman, who you should also follow if you enjoy modern metalcore because the dude is a fucking beast. In general, Jackson has a reasonable track record with bringing modern metal guys on board, right? Misha Mansour of Periphery has been with them a while. His signature is basically a bolt on super strat with a pickup upgrade. And that seems to be what Jackson's based their entire modern lineup on. Corey from Trivium, Christian from Gojira, and Mick Thompson from Slipknot, all of Jackson's signatures, which are still relevant, but it's great they've added Josh Smith and now hopefully Mike Stringer from the very latest crop of guitar players and pushed Jackson's modern guitars forward. As a guitarist, that's really what you want to see. You want to see Jackson compete at the same level as LTD, as Schechter. Look, they've got the old school offering sorted, and as a fan of the ultra modern sh this is the most interesting Jackson has ever been. And it's not even like they've officially dropped anything yet, but that's how disinterested I've been in them. And now there's a glimmer of hope. But yeah, that's what's going on. Here's where I'll throw it to you. What are your thoughts on Jackson guitars right now on their relationship with modern metal? What do you think of Mike Stringer joining them? Thoughts on Josh Smith's upcoming signature? Let me know what you're thinking. New World Man asks, when are we gonna get some amp reviews? Yeah, so if you've been following me on Instagram, you know that I've gotten a couple of new amps in recently. And if you aren't following me, <laughs> why not? I've gotten one that I've wanted for a long time. It's a certain British flavor that's been missing from Tone Mountain. Just use it for one of the upcoming demos and God, Damn, it sounds so good. Then I got an amp from another British company that I've never tried any product from before, so that's exciting. Been working on that demo this week, and that's partially why I'm behind on the mod video. And I've also got a couple more amps on the way, one from an American company, and I haven't featured one of their amps on the channel since 2018, I wanna say. Then I just had a call today with a contact from another British company, um, and they should be building an amp for us to check out together soon. I've never tried one of their tube heads either, and they've been back ordered for the last like six months. I was supposed to check one out with you guys in uh, like January, but then it got intercepted by Scott Ian of Anthrax. And I told my contact, you let that motherfucker Scott Ian know that I deeply respect his career in Anthrax fucking slaps. He never ended up using it for anything though. My contact said that he saw the box in a couple of the videos he did on Instagram with his son playing drums, but it doesn't seem like he opened it. So I don't know, maybe he could have shared. It's Scott Ian of Anthrax though. So, you know, fair enough. But yeah, man, like the tube shortage plus the guitar boom at the same time, it was impossible to get any big amps to demo. But just this week, I realized that I never actually put together a video for the Rev Generator 120. I don't know how that happened because it's pretty much the perfect studio amp. It covers so much ground and all four channels are great. You got your pure clean, you got your really vintagey classic crunch, your super tight high gain rhythm and a fat, angry, 
boosted recto-esque lead channel built in torpedo capture with direct xlr out so you've got unlimited customization through impulse responses and cab sims it's like an infinitely customizable virtual combo if you want to think of it that way i mean you can literally have this amp and your interface and that's it i mean cables obviously but that's your studio sorted. If I were just starting out from scratch today, that's that's what I'm getting. It is legitimately so useful and sounds so good for anything you would need it for. I'm thinking I should make that video. I love that amp. But yeah, getting back into the amp demo game, there's amps on the way. There's amps actually sitting right here just off camera. And I've actually got one already filmed and pretty much edited. It's an update to an American legend. It's been done for weeks. I've just literally been waiting to show you guys because it's not official out yet but it's cool man after like two years of everything being out of stock it seems like production is now finally starting to catch up now that the boom is somewhat over just ask fender the end of the boom for them has been rough there's actually inventory available for a demo which after the last two years is a wild concept so i'm getting to it they just take a while to film even more so than guitar demos and they really don't do as well for views but i've come to realize who gives it big ass tube heads they're expensive they're heavy they're inefficient but they're just so fucking cool man at the end of the day i just want to check out some cool with you guys you know that's really it as much as i love tube amps i didn't grow up around them none of my friends are gearheads and i feel like i'm just now starting to really scratch the surface of them it's such a deep rabbit hole there are so many iconic or highly regarded amps i still haven't tried yet EVH 5153, Soldano SLO, Friedman B100 Deluxe, Diesel Herbert, pretty much anything from Boutique Amps Distribution actually. But yeah, we're going balls deep into a ton of amp demos soon. So let me know, one, any guesses as to what amps are coming up? And two, now that it's actually possible to get amps, what do you want to see on the channel? I'd love your input. Like what's everybody curious about? What's everyone hyped about these days? And also your comments really help when I reach out to the amp makers or the amp distributors. Like it really helps when I can pull up screenshots and show them directly, hey, this is something that the community is curious or hyped about. Nick Webb asks, you say that Lamb of God isn't a modern enough band for where you think Gibson should be going. Who do you think would be someone they should sign up? Who would you like to see get the Gibson signature treatment? Well, that's not quite what I was saying, or at least not what I meant to say. The point I was making is, yeah, Lamb of God is a younger band than Megadeth and Metallica, but knowing Mark Morton's tastes and what his dominions are like, they're still going to be quite traditional. I love Lamb of God, I love Les Pauls, so I'm excited, but will his signatures break new ground for Gibson guitars? Almost definitely not. And I wasn't saying that's necessarily a bad thing, but if you're not already a Gibson person, or at least Gibson curious, is a Les Paul with different pickups going to win you over? Probably not. And that's been the theme with current Gibson signature models. They know their audience, they have their comfort zone, and they stick with it. Personally, as a fan of modern guitars and as a fan of Gibson guitars, I'd love to see a Les Paul with a uh, 28 inch scale length stainless steel frets and an Evertune. You know, you drop that as a regular production guitar, everyone's talking about it. You're grabbing the attention of a ton of people who otherwise wouldn't even look at a Gibson guitar. It doesn't even need to be a signature model. In fact, it would almost be preferable to be a limited Epiphone run or something, make it more affordable. The fact is, while a brand like ESP will do interesting stuff like that, Gibson won't. And something I'd really like to see is with their iconic status and all their resources, Gibson could be doing a way better job at supporting and developing younger brands. You know, how cool would it be if Gibson made a concerted effort to be the first ones to go to an artist like a Josh Smith of North Lane? I'm just using him as an example. I'm not saying they should steal him from Jackson, but be like, okay, your band's getting some traction. What do you plan? What do you need? Okay, 27 inch baritone scale length with an Evertune and bare knuckles. We can do that. What do you think about that in an explorer shape? You know, supporting these younger bands, providing the tools they need to push musical boundaries. You know, I get it. Signing Kirk Hammett, that's a huge statement. That sells guitars. But Metallica doesn't need the same support in the same way that bands who are gaining a little bit of traction but haven't quite made it yet do. You know, barely any of the younger metal bands I listen to play Gibsons and that should be alarming to them. It just seems like Gibson has completely given up with being on the cutting edge of music and on the cutting edge of guitar design in favor of being the legacy 
dad rock brand, which I guess, fair enough, they sell a shitload of guitars because their target audience has disposable income. But like, where's that scrappy startup energy or whatever JC was talking about when he took over as CEO? Finn McKenzie has a great video where he argues that mainstream rock and metal culture has become so traditionalist and obsessed with the past, which is kind of funny because the genre is rooted in counterculture, but now there's all these rules on how things should be done. And look, it's awesome that rock and metal fans are so loyal to the bands that we love. We'll support them for decades and not just throw them aside when the next shiny thing comes along. At the same time, it's a real problem for the long term. There aren't that many young bands that are being properly developed new sounds aren't being embraced as they once were. And the culture of being stuck in the past is reflected in the tools, in the guitars from the biggest mainstream brands. And it can be self-reinforcing. Every time they add a new feature, it's immediately written off by a large vocal part of the market. They haven't even tried it, but it's a gimmick, simply because it's new and that's not the way things have always been done. See Stainless Steel Frets, see Fishman Fluent, see Evertune. It sometimes feels like one big feedback loop and I'd love to see a big iconic company like Gibson who have been kind of guilty of fostering this culture of nostalgia, try to break it. This rant is getting a little off the rails, but anyways, all I was saying in that comment, uh, wasn't that I want to see more signature models from younger artists that are more progressive necessarily. I just want to see Gibson work more with younger artists, help them develop, maybe incorporate new design ideas from the next generation. It would be nice to see evolution from one of the largest forces in the industry, that's all. Matt Hafey's models being such a huge success for Epiphone, um, the origins were apparently the fastest selling Epiphone launch ever shows that there is a market for modernized Gibsons. And I mentioned it in another video, Cody from Wage War has been using a Gibson Explorer on tour recently. That could be a really good start. He's known for using Fender Jim Root Jazzmasters, so a 25 and a half inch scale length Explorer with Fishman Fluence would be really cool. Maybe a low profile hip shot bridge, no neck angle. I don't know, it's something different from just another Les Paul with a pickup swap, even though those are cool. I support those. Anyways, that was a huge rant. Your thoughts? Gibson being a traditionalist brand isn't a groundbreaking concept, but what do you think they should do about it, if anything? Should they hand out more signature models? If so, to who? Or no, they are what they are, and that's it. Let me know what you're thinking. The Iron Panda asks, hey man, it's really cool to see how much of the same bands we like based on some other bands we have heard you play, Metallica, Alter Bridge, Lamb of God. Yeah, that's exactly my top three bands in order. Trivium, Killswitch Engage, Slipknot, etc. in your videos. I've been wanting to check out Fishman Fluence pickups, but there's so many versions now. Classic, Modern, Hafey, Adler, Killswitch. Which are your favorites? Yeah, it's kind of a double-edged sword, right? When Fluence first launched, it was like, do you want classic or modern? That's it, super simple. With single coils or P90s, it's still that simple. But now for humbuckers, I hear what you're saying. You've got the originals plus all the signature sets with their own little tweaks to the formula. Having all this gear available is awesome. You can get really into the minute details and develop your own sound. But at the same time, the choice paralysis can be overwhelming. And even I haven't managed to try all of them yet. There are so many. I still haven't tried Tosin Abasi set or Stephen Carpenter set, although I hear that one is not great sounding, but my absolute favorite one that I've tried so far, without question, is the Willie Adler set. Something about it, maybe it's because it's got that combination of bar magnets and pole pieces. It's a set that sounds most natural, most alive, in my opinion. Fishman Fluence pickups are great because they're so clear, they're so high fidelity, but sometimes it's almost too clean. The Adler set has that fidelity, but they've also got a little traditional chaos, as Ken Susi puts it. The classic set is great. The modern set is fantastic. The Hafey set is essentially the modern set with the added single coil voice. That's why they've called it a custom set instead of a signature set. They were very clear about that talking point when I made my video. They were like, don't call it a signature set. It's a custom set. Keith Marrow has an amazing set too. Dude, I recommend all of them, but there is something special about the Adlers though. The thing is they only come with distressed gold covers for some reason, which doesn't fit every guitar, but they sound so fucking good. What about you guys? Got a favorite Fish and Fluence set? Keep this on your radar. Aaron Marshall of Intervals dropped his first signature Schecters, the AM6 and the AM7. He was a mayonnaise guy before. They make great guitars, handmade in Poland, and they're also quite 
pricey. So part of the reason he gave for moving to Schecter is he wanted to design a great guitar that was also more attainable at a more reasonable price point. So the AM6 comes in Arctic Jade, kind of a metallic green, basswood body, bolt-on, quarter-son, one game neck, which is really cool. The only other production guitars I can think of that have Wenge necks are Rubia's signatures. I tried one when I was over at Toman and the Wenge neck felt amazing. It's one of those oily woods. It's so slick and fast. That's a really great spec choice. And as I said, it's really uncommon on a production level guitar. I love that his handwritten signature and the band logo have been engraved on the back of the headstock. That's nice little touch. Ebony fingerboard with a compound 12 to 16 inch radius. The aluminum circle inlays I thought were really cool on my Keith Marrow signature. 24 extra jumbo stainless steel frets. Super blue aluminum lays, which is supposed to be more luminescent the normal lumen lays, graph tech nut, hip shot locking tuners, goto two point trem, and Schecter USA solstice and equinox humbuckers. Holy shit. That's a spec'd out guitar. The seven string and cobalt slate shares most of the same specs, except it's got a fixed hip shot bridge and the scale length is an inch longer at 26 and a half. Might try and see if I can demo one for Schecter because that wangy neck is really special. Then, it's crazy how many signature models Gibson and Epiphone have been dropping recently. And these have been a badly kept secret for a while if you keep up to date with the world of Gibson signatures, but they just released Noel Gallagher Semi Hollows last week. The custom shop dropped an aged Murphy Lab ES335, limited to just 200 units worldwide. It's a replica of a 1960 ES335 Noel Gallagher bought in 1997 as an investment collector's piece, but it ended up being so good that by the early 2000s, he was using it as a main stage guitar. And now everything's come full circle. It's the basis for 200 collector's pieces. It's got a Bigsby and a Veritone, which is pretty cool. Usually I don't f with Gibson semi hollows. The bodies are so bulbous, but there's something about an aged red one with a Bigsby it really cooks. Yes, that was a Back to the Future reference. <laughs> and on the Epiphone side, if you're like me and for some reason don't have the $10,000 to afford the Murphy Lab, they've dropped a Riviera in dark wine red. $8.99 for both right and left-handed versions because fun fact, Noel Gallagher plays right-handed, but is actually naturally left-handed. So it's nice fan service that Epiphone's done that. I'll be honest, I have no idea what the difference is between a Riviera and an ES-335, besides that the Riviera is originally an Epiphone model, ES-335 is all Gibson. In fact, the Noel Gallagher model looks closer to Epiphone's 335 than it does the Epi Riviera. <laughs> we move. Then in case you missed it, this week I tried the carbon fiber smart guitar that's been all over the internet so you don't have to. And in case you missed last Ask Fish, we talked about what I think is our first teased glimpse at Mark Morton's signature Les Pauls. We talked about new Fender and new Friedman launches, and we talked about Full Tone's gloriously tone deaf closing statement. Link to both those in the cards and in the description. And that will do it for this week's episode of Ask Fish. Huge shout out to my amazing patrons for supporting the channel. Their names are on the screen right now. If you wanna be awesome as well, support the channel and get bonus extras, link to that in the description. YouTube has also enabled a membership thing on this channel, I'm adding custom emoticons. But in the meantime, it's a nice way to leave a tip if you're enjoying the content. Social media, Discord, and affiliate links are in the description. As always, thank you so much for watching. You've been awesome and I will see you for the next video.